A moot is a legal case set in an appeal court, so it's a way to practice your advocacy in front of judges. Um, it's a great way to enhance your oral public speaking skills because you have a moot problem given to you at least two weeks before the competition and you have to prepare as either as part of the respondents or the appellants in this scenario. So um, each team has two advocates. We've got a senior counsel and a junior counsel. So the senior counsel is leading the moot and um, the junior counsel has pretty much the same authority but has a different grant of appeal they will be speaking on behalf of the counsel to. Um, each team presents arguments to the court either supporting or opposing the appeal. So you've got the um, respondents who are replying to the appeal and you've got the appellant's counsel which is appealing against that specific ground. Um, usually in a mooting competition we've got two judges but I'm not sure how this year if we'll have one or two judges in your competitions but um, the judges will determine your legal researching skills, your advocacy and they will also be looking at the way you present your submissions and the way you are formal in court. So I'm not too sure of how many have you done moots before, um, assuming that this might be your first moot um, for some of you, this might not be your first moot, you might have some experience in public speaking and debating before, but mooting is very different, you have to be very formal and um, we will be covering that also in the PowerPoint presentation today. Um, the moot problems, your first round will be um, quite soon, I'm not sure of the date, it's in these slides ahead. However, the moot problem will be based on a simple point of law. Submissions will be limited to 15 minutes per mooter. 15 minutes for both the junior and the senior counsels for both sides. And then the senior counsel for the appellant will have a right to reply after the moot is over. These 15 minutes are within the time of intervention by the judges. So the judges can ask absolutely how many questions they wish to ask. It can range from no questions at all, it can range to five to six questions. The judges can be very, um, I'd say, savage in the scenario where they'll be asking you quite a lot of questions sometimes just to test if you can, you're good on thinking on spot skills as well. Um, why should you mute? I'm sure you all have signed up to for specific reasons. However, just to go through a bit of the basics, improves your advocacy, public speaking skills. Um, to be fair, a lot of legal research is involved. So last year I participated in the mooting competition for Cardiff Uni and um, it's like doing a different module. I'm not putting you off mooting or at all, but it is a lot of commitment and we usually sometimes do have dropouts. However, this year we're trying not to have so because if you drop out, sometimes your partner is affected, even though you are judged on your own um, performance in the mooting competition. Um, you work as a team. I'm mentioning it as individual effort, but end of the day, it's just better to have support from your junior or senior counsel because you can discuss any issues you've got in the mooting competition. Something you don't understand, you can always discuss it with your senior or junior um, counsel. You present oral and written arguments, and to be fair, it is quite fun. I enjoyed it a lot last year. Um, we had, I think, five rounds, and um, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, You've got different cases ranging from criminal, civil to commercial law cases, and you really develop your skills in every area of the law over there. Um, it's great for the CV, obviously everything we do is for the CV sometimes. Um, it also advances your skills and interest in the legal profession. Um, mooting is both for solicitors and barristers, whichever route you wish to pursue. I think public speaking is very important in any field of life. Um, Moving on to the structure of the moot, just wondering, does anyone have any questions until now about what mooting is, how it may help you or anything at all? We have one question from Katie and she's asking whether she can, the part participants will get these uh, PowerPoint slides. Oh, um, yeah, um, yes you can. I will, if you want, I will send this over to you. Um, to all the participants of the internal winning competition. Thank you for the question. Okay, so moving on to the structure of the moot. Um, so you've got the first round. Uh, since you know, usually mooting is limit is not limited to any number of people in the law school. However, this year because it is over virtual platforms, we have thirty two participants, and you all were. Um, amongst those. So um, the first round is a non-knockout round. So obviously it's the first way to just practice mooting on your feet and being able to speak and getting used to the court um, 
formalities and the different terms you have to use in court. So the first round will be taking place. I assume you have been sent a calendar by Jessica Matt from the law school. If you have not, then you'll be receiving it in this week, by the end of this week. Your round will be taking place, if I'm not wrong, in the first week of December. I could be wrong over here. Um, this is a non knockout round, so your performance will not matter at all, and you will proceed to the next round, which will take place after the Christmas break. Um, I'm not sure if Jessica has sent you over the mooting problem, however, um, it will be sent at least two weeks before and um, you will know who your partners are and partner partners are allocated at a very random basis, so please do not worry if you some some for some reason do not want, wish to work with your partner it is a mooting competition it would be great if you just both work together and sometimes you may not have a partner because people do drop out so if that is a scenario do not worry once again because end of the day you are being judged on your individual performance in the mooting competition um, at the end of this uh, session, we will be showing you the how the judges will mark your uh, mooting competition. So we've got 10 marks for oral advocacy. We've got 10 marks for legal research skills. So um, obviously the two mooters from the round. So in a round, you've got four mooters, two from the um, appellant side and two from the respondent side. So um, two mooters will proceed to the next round. So. In your second round, which will be after the Christmas break, from that will be a knockout round. So only two people from each round will be proceeding. And it could be that there could be one senior respondent who proceeds and a one junior appellant who proceeds. So not necessarily the entire team proceeds. It could be very individual because once again, I'm emphasizing it is an individual performance at the end of the day. Um, moving on to the next slide. So, um, I think I mentioned this, but I will go through it once again to clarify. Um, you have four participants and you've got 15 minutes per person. So um, the first person who goes is the lead counsel for the appellant. You have 15 minutes exactly. Right after that, you have got the junior counsel, <clears throat> excuse me, for the appellant. And then you have, <clears throat> sorry. You've got the lead counsel for the respondent and then you've got the junior counsel for the respondent. So 15 minutes each. And then at the end, you've got a lead counsel right to reply for the appellant side. So right to reply is basically a rebuttal. Does anyone know what a rebuttal is? Anyone can just unmute themselves to say what a rebuttal is. Any idea maybe? Okay, that's fine. Um, it feels like I'm speaking to myself, but hopefully um, when we put you into breakout rooms, you'll be able to share your thoughts with your team members. Right, so right to reply is when you try to um, argue against the points made by the respondent side. So this is given to the lead counsel for the appellants um, and you have exactly five minutes and you cover only your ground, you could cover the junior counsel's ground, but usually what happens is that um, they, the lead counsel covers their ground and um, during the speech of the lead counsel for the respondent, the lead counsel for the appellant makes um, notes at whatever they think they can possibly rebut for the mooting competition. So um, you have five minutes to do so. However, I know you might be thinking that is this somehow unfair advantage to the lead counsel because they get a speak, they get a chance to speak again. This is not because um, this necessarily does not give you marks. It is a completely optional thing. If you do not wish to exercise the right of your reply, you may not do so. However, if you've got anything you want to add after the um, respondent side finishes their submissions, you may add so. So it does not necessarily give you any marks, but at the same time, it's just a way to maybe rebut whatever your respondent's um, opposing counsel has been saying for the past 30 minutes. Um, moving on to the skeleton argument. So I would say potentially the skeleton argument is probably the most important part of the moot. Um, so once a moot problem has been assigned to you all, you will be arranging a skeleton argument. So a skeleton argument, I hope you can all see this and it's not too small. Right. Each team must prepare a skeleton argument which should not exceed two sheets of a A4 paper. So, um, you have basically two pages to submit your skeleton argument on and this is what is sent to the judges and to your opposing counsels 48 hours before your mooting competition. So in your skeleton argument you basically summarize everything that you have put in your submissions. Um, 
at the end of this PowerPoint presentation, we will be assigning you into breakout rooms and we'll give you a mooting problem and an example skeleton argument. So um, please do not worry if you do not understand what skeleton argument is right now. We will be talking about that in a while. So um, since there are two members in the team and you cannot use more than eight authorities, um, I need to emphasize that usually what happens is you look at cases and you realize that I've got too many cases and you cannot put all of them, unfortunately, because you have limited time. And in a real court, the judge is not gonna keep listening to you for hours and hours. You will have not more than 15 minutes at the max. So um, in a skeleton argument, so there's one from the respondent side, one from the appellant side, and um, you send over skeleton arguments 48 hours before the mooting competition. So in the skeleton argument, you have the, um, the name of the court, you have the name of the people who are whose case it is, the appellants and the respondent side, and then you have the material facts of the case. So um, you, when you've given a moot problem, it usually ranges from two to three pages. You have to summarize all of that into, let's say, six lines, put that as your material fact in the skeleton argument. Then you have the grounds of appeal. So for the respondent side, you will have two grounds of appeal. For the, for the appellant side, you will have two different grounds of appeal because you are obviously contradicting what each other are saying. So you have different grounds um, also. Now, mentioning how you can use eight authorities, you are allowed to make it fair, four authorities per individual. So the senior counsel for appellant and the junior counsel for the appellant will have four cases or journals or books or whatever they wish to cite in their submissions. So four per mooter, you cannot exceed this. However, if you do not have four, it's fine if you have three, two, one, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, they can range from cases let me clarify when it comes to cases if a if a case is if your moot problem is based on the supreme court you cannot potentially use a case lower than the supreme court you you cannot use court of appeal you cannot use that because that is lower and the judge will simply ask you why do you think i'm going to follow a court which is lower than the supreme court so there's no point of using them however you can use them sometimes in very rare circumstances as a um, authority, I forgot the name of the authority, but I will hopefully remember by the end of the session. Um, so you can use it saying that it is a very accurate authority. And if it's very recent, then obviously you can add that it was a year ago, it was three months ago, and the court should be following it for such and such a reason. We will be um, elaborating on this when it comes to the breakout Zoom rooms. Um, so you can use cases, you can use extracts from cases as well. Um, how to back up your cases is when you use extracts from cases. And then you can also use reports, you can use parliamentary papers, you can use articles, but um, potentially articles would be a secondary source. Um, I would recommend, this is just my personal opinion over here, cases are the best way. So you get cases on Westlaw, find your cases, open their legal judgments, the entire transcript, it's going to be very long. It will range from 30 pages to sometimes 40. Sometimes it's very short as well. However, you will have to read the entire thing and you will have to highlight the important bits which you wish to inculcate in your moot and your submissions. So um, it's preferred that you use cases. However, you can use um, articles by different people or books as well. Also, if you have cited a case that has been decided in more than one court, it will be counted as one authority. And then um, if the case is similar for both the appellants and the respondents, that will obviously be different authorities because both have done their own work to cite that case. Um, what else? Yes, right here. Um, two working days before the skeleton argument is supposed to be um, exchanged with, by the um, councils and usually there are some issues when it comes to exchanging skeleton arguments but what a good practice would be as soon as your teams get allocated I'm not sure when that will be done but hopefully by the end of this week Jessica will send you over an email with your um, team members and the rounds also, let me um, emphasize, you will have different partners for every mooting competition. You will not have the same people and they will be randomly allocated to you. Um, so you'll be sending your skeleton argument two working days before. This gives you a time to maybe potentially somehow look at your opposing counsel's argument. And if you wish to make some changes in your submissions, you can always do so. 
Late submission usually has a lot of issues. If you tend to submit a skeleton argument very late, the judge may not consider your skeleton argument at all. And you might be allowed, obviously, depending on what the circumstances are. So this is very, um, it varies for every individual. However, the rule is to send it two working days before or else your marks will be cut down from the winning competition because it will give you an unfair advantage over your opposing counsel. Because if they have sent you their skeleton argument, they also deserve to get your skeleton argument two days before the winning competition. Before I move on to the advocacy, um, from personal experience, um, usually in the first meeting competition, people have scripts. So you have a skeleton argument which you're referring to, and then you also have a script which you can potentially read off from. However, that is something you would not want to do because when you read off, it really shows that you're just reading off a piece of paper. You fail to make eye contact with the judge, which is very important and gives you high marks in the meeting competition. It rather should be like a conversation between you and the judge rather than you basically just looking down on the table and reading from a piece of paper. However, since this is virtual, it is quite different. What people usually tend to do is do split screen. So that is a tip for you all. If you do not wish to memorize, obviously memorizing is a lot. However, you could just split screen your Zoom call on the side with your judge and maybe just somehow put on the other side your script. However, once again, um, when your eyes move in the webcam, I'm gonna try doing it. If you can see that I'm moving my eyes now and I'm, it seems like I'm reading. So, um, that is something the judge will notice because in my semi-finals our judge um, could see who was reading and could see who was not reading off the screen so it's recommended that you try not to memorize but as long as you've done your legal research i'm sure you'll be aware of all the cases and you would not have to potentially read off anything um, obviously you can refer to it however using a script and reading off which many people tend to do even in the late turn knockout rounds does put you as a significant disadvantage i would say Moving on, does anyone have any questions about the script, the skeleton argument, or absolutely anything? Please feel free to unmute yourselves or drop it in the chat box. You, are there any questions at all? Yes, we have a question from Ryan, and he asked if he can use statutes, or is that not relevant? Actually, I can answer that. Yeah, statute would be counted as an authority. So you can definitely use a statute. Thank you. Any other questions? No, okay. Uh, um, no. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. I forgot to mention. Um, yes, you can use statutes. That is my bad. I should have mentioned that right before cases. Statute is a primary authority and you can use it. Please do use it if you want to. Um, Usually in the meeting problem, you will have statutes given, for example, the something something act of 1979, you can refer to that, however, that will be used as the authority, because if you do seem to work on that and do your details on it and um, our first meeting competition last year was about um, human rights and um, if you refer to article 8 of the ECHR that is an authority so be careful you only have four authorities allowed but statute would be a important authority because it is a very strong one so you can use that along with cases and different books or journals you wish to use moving on to the advocacy right so as I mentioned I will go through the judges feedback the judges sheet which they will mark you on at the end of the session and um you have 10 yeah you have 10 marks for your um i'd say legal research skills and then you have 10 marks for your um advocacy i personally think there's always an immune competition aside which is going to be the winner so in a competition or even in a case you will always have a stronger side which has i'd say more cases for them and that is very i'd say it's very random, but there is usually one side which has a stronger ground of appeal and therefore they may be the winning side. But at the same time, they don't have to be the winning side. And usually sometimes they may not be the winning side because the way they um, spoke to the judges, the way they presented their submissions may not be as good as the other opposing counsel did. So in this scenario, you have to focus a lot on your advocacy and how the way you persuade the judges. Um, and if you are reading off a script, it will look it will come across as basically you're just reading off a book and you've not interacted with the judges at all. So I really would emphasize that 
try not to rely on your scripts. Obviously, for the first non-knockout round, you may want to do that, and that is perfectly fine. It's your first round. However, in the later rounds, because they are knockout and you have a possibility of hopefully proceeding to the next one. If not, then you just have to be very careful. So I would really emphasize on oral advocacy and trying to persuade the judges. And um, many, of, many of you may not have practiced public speaking skills, which is absolutely fine. This is a great way for you to um, get into it from an early stage. If you're in second year, that's great. If you're in third year, that's fine as well. Um, you can always learn public speaking skills. It's going to really improve your confidence because honestly speaking, um, before doing mooting last year, I had no idea how to speak in a court. But um, when I did the mooting rounds, I'd say while they did require a lot of dedication and commitment, um, they really did improve my um, personal speaking skills when it comes to speaking to the judges. Um, I hope I'm not going too far with them with my personal experiences, but I'm going to quickly mention something. I took part in a, a mooting competition a few months ago and it was virtual. And the I had 10 minutes to go with my submissions and um, the judge was very rude. Um, I'm not meaning that in any bad way. However, she took eight minutes of my time. So I had two minutes to basically submit my um, grounds of appeal and um, eight minutes, she kept asking me questions and she kept uh, bringing down every point I mentioned to her because she just says, I'm not convinced of with it enough. And she says, I want you to elaborate more. So you can get judges who will be very, um, who will ask you a lot of questions. They may take a lot of your time, but hopefully um, in your first few rounds, that will not be happening. This was a, not a card of uni round to be fair. So maybe that's why the judges were quite, um, um, intervened quite a lot I'd say so do not worry but at the same time you do learn quite a lot of improvisation skills where you think on your spot and you can always reply back to the judges and if you do not know the answer you can always say um thank you my lady my lord for your question I will like to proceed with my submissions as I have no answer to your question and the judge is not gonna say anything after that I will go with the formalities of the court very soon so don't worry if you're scared why I said my lord my lady that's perfectly fine Moving on to being formal in court. Um, so um, in real life, if this was obviously not the pandemic or anything, we would be having these in um, classrooms in the law school. So you would have two judges and you would have to dress very smart, just, a just like a solicitor or a barrister would do so in real life. So you would have to wear a suit. Um, you would have to look very smart. Um, if this was in real life, I would tell you how sometimes judges do call out on your um, dressing style. It happened last year, actually. Um, some individual was wearing a yellow colored um, shirt with a black colored um, suit on top. And the judge asked her, why are you wearing yellow? So be careful with what you're wearing. The judges do not want to get, um, I'd say, distracted by your uh, dressing. They want to be focusing just on your submissions. So make sure you're looking neat, clean, tidy, nice, and wearing a nice suit. Obviously, because it's on Zoom, you can wear anything on the top. So um, as long as it looks nice and you can be in your trousers, it's perfectly fine because you just get to see to your shoulders anyways. So um, dress smart, I would say. I would really emphasize on dressing smart and um, make sure your hair is not so in front or anything. It's tied back neatly and nicely because um, the judges do get distracted and they will call you out on it. Um, just to avoid any of you um, feeling bad if the judges do. So just please be careful with your dressing because they will be very strict. Um, and if this would be a physical mood, they would be extremely strict on what you're wearing and how you're dressing up for your case. Since end of the day, you are representing your clients. Moving on, I have mentioned the accessibility of virtual split screen and everything. Um, one thing which is really important is that you take your time to speak. Make sure that your pace is appropriate. I know when you're nervous, you usually go really fast because I did that in my first move and I went really fast and I started eating up my words. Please do not do that. Um, that will cut a lot of marks. The judge will not understand what you're saying. They won't have time to even question you. They will straight put quite low marks in your um, advocacy skills. Take out time to prepare beforehand. I know for final years, I know it's really hectic, even for second years, obviously, but um, make sure you take that time for your mood. Do not leave anything to last minute. If you're given the problem two weeks before, start when it's given to you. Start with 
research. Start with looking at what cases you might want to do. Start with looking at um, which grant of appeal you wish to choose. Um, I'm going to quickly mention this. Um, I will elaborate in the um, breakout rooms. However, because it is um, two grounds of appeal and you have a partner, you and your partner both have to decide who is going to be doing which appeal ground. So sometimes grounds of appeal may be very different. One ground may be easier, not saying it's easier, I'd say less complicated than the other one. So please just sit down with your partner, speak out to them which one you wish to do. Um, and hopefully it, there should be no issue in which kind of appeal you wish to do. Um, usually I will give you a tip where you both can possibly do is when the moot problem is given to you, um, don't be very competitive and just say, oh no, I'm gonna do ground one, you can do ground two. Just sit down, speak about it. Um, both of you do your research on both grounds and whoever gets more cases for one ground can do that ground and whoever gets more cases for the other can, uh, other ground can do that because this way you both know each other's grounds and it's a good way of trying to make sure that it's fair when it comes to when it comes to dividing your grounds amongst yourselves okay back on saying take your time to read on everything don't be nervous i know everyone is going to be nervous when it comes to the mooting competition however try your best to um Try your best to go slowly when you're speaking to the judges. Um, please don't eat up your words and you have 15 minutes. Um, it may be less time, it may be a lot of time for some of you. However, just make sure you divide that time for your submissions very carefully. If you are presenting three submissions, then maybe put three to four minutes for every submission and take out two minutes for your questions because judges will ask a lot of questions and sometimes their questions will throw you off completely. And if you are reading a script, if a judge asks you a question, you cannot possibly go back to that script because their question may cover something you've already, you're going to be saying in the script later on. So that is the disadvantage of having a script is that sometimes you will get thrown off and when you get back to your script, you will say, where do I begin with? From now. So make sure you know your problem very well, make sure you know your cases and submissions very well. Sometimes this is usually in the semi-finals and the finals, the judges will ask you to present your submissions from the other way around. So if you've got three submissions and a skeleton argument, they will ask you to start with your third submission. And if you've got a script, then unfortunately you will not know how to do, what to do, when to do. So be very careful with that and with having a script. Obviously, once again, if you wish to keep a script, that is personally your choice. Um, please do so. Don't think that I'm telling you not to keep a script. I'm just emphasizing that it will, um, I'd say, reduce your marks. Um, however, if you think you're more confident with a script and you don't have to constantly look at it, please refer to it. I had a script in my old rounds. However, I didn't have a script. I had um, bullet points written down so I can always speak about them rather than basically reading them off from the paper when it came to my um, physical moods. So be very careful with that. Um, moving on from the scripts, uh, we will be talking about court language um, and yes, um, one really important thing actually, distracting manners. So I think you can all see my video right now. Um, please don't sit like this or like this or constantly keep moving because the judges will not like that. Um, judges are very picky, I would say, and because they've got experience themselves of the, of the mooting competitions, be very careful. Um, some of them may be very good at mooting and they will call out on you right in the moot. They will tell you, can you please stop moving? We cannot, we're distracted by whatever you're doing. Uh, make sure you don't have a pen, you keep clicking. Make sure that when it's the screen, um, everything can be seen. Make sure your head's not being cut off just like mine is right now. Um, make sure that everything can be seen. So please be very careful and do not do different uh, distractions in front of them. Also, uh, we have this um, tendency to say a lot of different words from um, basically because like, please try not to do so because they will cut down marks for that when it comes to your oral advocacy. Um, a really good technique would be um, two, three days before the mooting competition, record yourself. I used to do, do that all the time. I would ask my um, friends to watch me do, a, do my moot and um, they would criticize everything which they felt was out of place, which was not necessarily. So please do that. Uh, make sure your friends do that for you. If not your family, if not, just look at yourself in the mirror and do your mooting competition right in front of you. Think the mirror, uh, look, just look at the mirror and um, 
you will notice a lot of things you tend to do and you will hopefully stop doing them. However, for the first round, don't be too harsh on yourself. It is your first round and you will learn a lot after your first round as well. Um, moving on to court language, I'm gonna pass it on to you because I've been speaking for too long now. So you, if you please start with being, um, sorry, court language, I'm gonna stop now. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think before that, I would want to answer a question from Katie. And so she, following from the question just now, so Katie asked if the statute would be included as one of the four authorities. So Tareem, will you want to answer on that? Because I think what she's basically, basically asking is that if one of the statutes is already included in the judgment of a particular case, would it be counted as one of the four authorities? Yeah. That's quite a good question. Sorry for not clarifying that before, Katie. Um, I will refer you back to my first meeting competition, which was on um, the human rights case. So we had Article 8 of the ECHR. Um, and if you tend to use it, and if you are making points from that statute law, then yes, it is an authority. However, if you're basically merely stating that yes, Article 8 of the ECHR says this, 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 that is fine. It will not be counted as an authority. But if you decide to make an entire paragraph of your submission based on Article 8 and you're going to be speaking about it and you will be elaborating on that, then that will be counted as an authority. Does that clarify your question, Katie? Can you please just um, let us know? If not, then I'll give you another example. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, back to you. Can you please begin with the court language? Sure. So we'll be talking about the court language. So as Terry mentioned, why mood is so different from your normal uh, debate or other advocacy competition is that we tend to expect participants to use formal court language. So uh, Following from that conversation, mood is basically a submission-based advocacy and should be viewed as a conversation between you and the judge. So that is why you need to use formal court language. So the court is more concerned with the substance of your legal arguments. So make sure they are all clear, concise, and persuasive. So next, you should also avoid phrases like in my opinion or in our opinion or we think that because the court is not concerned with your views but they want to know how are you going to advise your client so it's not based on your personal opinion when you reach the submission stage so it is also very important to ensure that you address the court correctly whether it is a high court court of appeal or a supreme court so the correct mood of the address will be given uh, in your mood question. So just to keep an eye out and make sure you don't make this mistake in your skeleton argument as well or, or your mark will be uh, deducted. So when mooting, you will usually either be appearing in the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court. But the mood of the address in both these courts it will be the same. So how do you address judge? You address a male judge as my lord and a female judge as my lady. So if you appear before a panel of more than one judge at the same time, so you will just use the plural of my lords or my ladies or female. But if there is a mixture of male judges and female judges, you will just uh, address all the judges as my lords. On to the next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, a further discussion on the formalities. So how does your submission work? Your arguments as mentioned, each council, senior council and junior council will usually make two uh, arguments each. So one is usually legal and one is usually based on public policy grounds. So your submissions, the points you are making is essentially the ground of appeal. So they are actually the basic legal points you are arguing. So you usually have two of these per side. So how do you address your teammate 
you address them as your if you are the senior uh, counsel you address the junior counsel as my learned junior counsel if you are the junior you address them the other way around uh, my learned senior counsel and you address your opponent as my learned friend so these uh, address are very important because as i said moot court is actually very dependable on these formal court languages so when you are uh, trying to submit or you are trying to interrupt you have to also uh, seek uh, permission from the court so how do you do that you can one of the example is may it please the court that i want uh, that i want you to, uh, i want my lord to refer to this uh, specific paragraph that you want to make your submission Yeah, uh, on to the next one. Yep. So this is a example of how you would submit. So as a lead counsel from the appellant side, you would basically say, my name is Mr. Ng and I appear as the senior counsel representing the appellant. And my learned friend, Miss Sutton, will be the junior counsel for the appellant. Across the way, and you so a, a very essential point here is that you as a leading counsel from the appellant side, you need to know the names of your learned friend. So you need to know the names of the opponents before the mood start because as a leading appellant, you have the responsibility of addressing the names of all the uh, counsels as well as from the opponent side and you have to give a brief summary of the facts. This is what usually leading counsel from the appellant side will do. So that is why the leading counsel from the appellant side will be given a five minutes time to rebut at the end. And after you address the opponent, so you need to address the judge. My Lord, there are two grounds of appeal in the instant case and you will mention I would deal with the first one and my learned junior, junior counsel will deal with the second. And you, you have to mention what are the grounds. They are such. So although judges will normally request a brief summary of facts, but it is good that you ask the judge whether they need one because they might be uh, judging a few mood on the same facts and they might not need that and if they do not need that you might have more time to submit your points and that would be uh, better for you so you will go on with would your lordship find a brief summary of the facts of the instant case helpful if they need it then you just brief them so after that you have to, after your summary of the facts, if you have to also ask the judge if they have any questions on the facts of the case. So you have to go on with, if your lordship has no further questions on the facts of the case, I shall proceed to my submissions. And you say, my lord, I have two submissions to make. The first one is, and the second one is, yeah. So after mentioning these two points, it is a good practice that you always ask permission before you proceed to the next stage. And a good example to do that is you will say, if it pleases your lordship, I will begin with my first submission. And after that, you will say, my lord, it is for these reasons and also that I urge you to allow the repeal, uh, to allow the appeal as your conclusion. So you have to also ask the judge if they have any further questions. If not, that concludes your submissions. On to the next slide, please. I'm going to quickly interrupt for something small. Um, okay. Are there any questions from anyone? Um, if you are unclear about the introduction for the um, 
competition, please let us know. I will show you another example right now. So just please let me know. If you could just unmute yourselves, that'd be great. Just let me know if you're clear about it, then I'm gonna then we're gonna proceed with the um, interruption and how to handle questions. If you're not, then we can show you another example of how to speak in your winning competition. So we have a question from Jessica and she asks, how would you address a female judge? So you will address a female judge as your lady. If it is a mixture of female and male judges and you will address them genuinely as your lordships. I hope that uh, clarify your doubts, Jessica. Um, any other questions you? No. Um, could you all please just quickly send a yes or a no if you want to proceed now with the uh, further slides or shall I move back and show another example for how to begin your introduction? Yes, we got yeses. Yeses? Okay, we'll proceed. Uh, so Book Tower requested for another example. Okay, um, I'm going to find one right now. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, you can you see my screen right now? No. Uh, not. One second. I'm going to start sharing again. Um, you are there any other questions? Meanwhile, if you wish to answer them, I'm going to have a look. Um, no, currently. That's great. Sorry, my laptop is being a bit slow. Just a minute, and I should open up. You, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Right, guys, I'm going to quickly go through this one, um, just so that I don't take too much time. Um, this can be a potential interruption for your winning competition. This is from my um, meeting for last year. May it please the court, my lord, my lady, depending on your judges, my name is Miss Sultan and I appear as junior counsel on behalf of the appellants, Mr. and Miss Huggins. So these are the appellants, my clients. Across the way, the respondent, Mr. Hobdell, is represented by my learned friend, Miss Fish, as lead counsel, and Miss Nadine as junior counsel. This is the hearing of the appeal against the decision of Mr. Justice Ryman in the Court of Appeal Civil Division, where the injunction to be granted to Mr. and Miss Huggins was refused. That means I am appealing against that injunction. Mr. and Miss Huggins now appeal against the decision on two grounds. The first ground is that the learned judge erred in law and finding necessary. This, this, this. My lord, my lady, the second ground is this, this, this. Um, I can't remember whose question it was, but I think it was Katie. Um, this, if you cite an article, a statute law like this, that is perfectly fine. That is not an authority. However, if I will elaborate on Article Nine of the ECHR, it will become an authority. Moving back to the script, after I have done my introduction, I'm going to move on to asking my judges if they would find a brief summary of the facts of the instant case helpful, considering it is a mixed. Um, a combination of judges got a male and a female I would say would your lordships that would refer to both of them proceeding to the facts of the case it depends if the judge says yes you will state all of these facts if they say no you will not have to state these facts let me clarify um I think I forgot to mention this um the senior counsel of the appellant has to do the introduction and the facts of the case for everyone in the moot. So if you're senior counsel, please put aside a minute for doing so. So if you're senior counsel, you will be doing all of this. 
all of this and asking the judges about the facts of the case. However, if you're anything other than senior counsel for the appellant only, you will not be asking the judges for the facts of the case because they've already been asked by the senior counsel of the appellant's side. Moving on, I will be then a good practice is to summarize your plans for today's submissions. My first submission shall be referring to Article 9 of the case of Arrow Smith as referred to paragraph 6, 7 of my skeleton argument. And this way you can now move on to saying if your lordships have no further question, I will proceed with my submissions. I hope that clarifies it for you all. If there are any questions, please just let us know. So we have a question from Ryan and he is asking for the summary of facts that you give to the judge, if they need it, do we just include the material facts? Yes, just the material facts of the case. So okay. um, basically all the necessary um, facts you won't have to um, explain to the judges to tell them what exactly the case is based on, just the material facts. Um, yeah. So in the in your like little skeleton of what you say, you would say like, would your lordship find a brief summary of the facts of the instant case helpful? Um, in the case that you're talking about. Yes. Yes. I I can't remember if I mentioned instant. If I did, that's my bad. Um, you don't have to say instant necessarily. You can just say, would my lord, my lady, um, want the summary of the case uh, helpful? That's it. You don't have to say instant, but if you wish to, it means the case you're talking about. Yes. Okay. And um, yeah. So if you were saying your lordship, would you say your ladyship? Yes. So it is my lady, my lord, yeah. um, your ladyship, your lordship. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Um, okay. If that is the last question, you you may proceed with the interruptions, please. Yeah, sure. So on to interruptions. So interruptions, as uh, mentioned by Tareem just now, uh, she gave a, an example whereby the judges asked a whole lot of questions during her submission. But this is normal, but not as long as eight minutes, I would say. So as a first timer, don't be flustered by the questions when you're submitting. So when judges ask you question, take a moment to think and answer politely and we will discuss more of this in the later workshop but an advice that I can give is that uh, take your time don't answer it uh, and don't be panicked uh, don't think that the judge want the answer instantly if they are asking something that uh, too complicated you, you can always ask so as being mentioned in this uh, example below, you can say that I would think I would thank your lordship for having raised that point, and if your lordship would permit me, I shall endeavor to answer it by moving on to my second submission on public policy. So this example can be used when the question being asked by the judge will be answered in your uh, following submission, or subsequently will be mentioned by your junior counsel. And the following example, as I mentioned, if the, ans uh, the, if the question is too complicated, you can always ask for permission to consult to your notes and you can go with, my Lord, may I have a moment to consult my notes? This, is, this can be applied if you are not sure of the answer and you can always refer back to the judgment of the authorities that you cited. So how after an, uh, answering these questions by the judge, so you have to give a conclusion. You have to be clear and concise, and you do not have time for a lengthy conclusion because you are still submitting, and uh, sometimes you may have may still have a few points to submit, and this is just half of your submission. So given the lengthy length of time allocated. So it is not necessary either to recap the submissions. So just give a brief conclusion and then move on. And when you come to the conclusion of your submission, so just briefly mention what you have submitted. And so this can give like the judge a clear image of the authorities or the statutes that you have cited and yeah, so just give a very short conclusion. Uh, on to the next slide, please. 
Um, right, okay. Thank you, you. Uh, basically, so um, we have got the judges feedback sheet, but I was hoping we should discuss it after the breakout room, rooms are been assigned and after we discuss the skeleton argument. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a, um, is that fine with you, you? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay, great. So uh, we will put you into breakout rooms. I think there are 27 participants. So let's say four to five people in every room. Um, Please, 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 can it be interactive? Um, it's for your own benefit. You just have to, I'm gonna assign you a moot problem. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm gonna assign you a moot problem. And um, if you could please look, have a look at that. And then if you could also please discuss it amongst yourselves, um, you have 10 minutes, I'd say, um, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we're gonna drop in and we're gonna speak to you about how the, um, you came up with a skeleton argument, what you think the material facts were, and um, basically all of that. And then when that is done, we'll put you back together in the main room and we will show you the skeleton example argument for the same moot problem. Um, I hope that works fine with everyone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, before I do so, let me remind you all of a few more things. Um, sorry, just a second. So, um, if there's a case which is R, which says R V Brown, please do not say the case of R and Brown. You'll be marked down for it. Say the case of Crown and Brown. So if it's R V Brown, if that's how the case is written on wherever you find it, please say the case of Crown and Brown. I need to emphasize because many people got cut down last year because of that. So please be very careful. Um, also, but when before I move to the judges feedback sheet after the 15 minute session, I'm going to be discussing how to um, put together your bundle authorities. Bundle authorities also have marks and it is the way you put together your submissions and your cases you have found and the way you send them over to the judges. In real life, we usually have a really big folder of um, colorful post-its everywhere where you're just kind of referring the judges that this is tab one, tab two, tab three. Because this is virtual, it will be different. However, I will show you that as well at the end of the session. Um, also, since this is, let's say, um, since this is a virtual moot, you will have 15 minutes. In the physical moot, you will have to be careful of your own time. And when, it, when the clock hits 15 minutes, um, the judge will literally tell you, can you please stop speaking now? So um, when this is a virtual mood, um, usually there will be either someone in that room, either Jessica or Ellie, who will show you up a paper saying that you have 10 minutes remaining or you have five minutes remaining. So we'll just show you that, oh, now you have five minutes remaining and it will please have a look at that. So please be careful of your own time. I would recommend put a timer um, right by your screen just so that you know if you're on time or not. And please do not exceed because if you do, you will be cut down. In fact, the judges will tell you to stop speaking. So even if you do not finish your submissions, you will have to stop speaking. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can put you all into breakout rooms. And before I do so, I'm going to show you a mooting problem just so that it is in the recording we've got. So Amy asked, can the participants watch the other moots that they are not involved with, which is like not their teams, but they, if they wish to watch other moots, I think I can answer that. Uh, because uh, some of the moots will be Will, will be held simultaneously so it, it will be very hard for you for us to allocate uh, like viewers or publics to view the mood so what what do you think about that yes unfortunately that would not be possible because um, even in physical moods that was not possible for anyone to um, observe the moods so sorry we can't do that um, However, we hope that you can practice with your teammates beforehand, if that helps anyway. And if you've got any questions or any issues, please just email us and we will be able to help you out with that, hopefully. Um, it's just that if it's another team, they may get nervous and um, usually everyone is very nervous. And also because it is virtual as well, we are limiting it to not more than six people per the Zoom call or Microsoft Teams. So I hope that answers your question. Um, right, I'm going to start sharing screen. Um, can everyone see that? Can you see that, you? Yep, I can yeah. see that. Um, 
Unfortunately, I haven't sent this out to all of you. If you all could maybe take a screenshot so that you can discuss it in your breakout rooms, please. I'm not going to discuss this now. We will discuss this after it has been done by you guys in your breakout rooms. Has everyone taken a picture? So I can move on to the next page. So um, in the breakout rooms, I see we have 22 participants now. We had 28 before. Um, I want you all to please focus on the appellant side. And I want you to figure out who the appellants in the scenario are. I want you to um, figure out who the appellants are. I want you to focus on the appellant's grounds of appeals. And um, then maybe you can somehow come up with a skeleton argument. I wish I could tell you who the appellants are, but I think it's pretty obvious who they are. So um, if you could please take a screenshot so that I may now assign you into breakout rooms. As you can see, sorry, this is a wrong date. In the Court of Appeal, Civil Division, appellant's name, respondent's name, Skeleton argument on behalf of the appellants. I'm assuming everyone did figure out that Max is the appellant and there were two grounds of appeal. And I hope you could um, figure out what the facts of the case were. Um, any volunteer to maybe discuss the facts of the case before I show them? Anyone would like to maybe discuss them? Okay, uh, I'm assuming nope. So we look at the facts of the case now. As you can see, they should be precise, very accurate, and not too much considering you've got only two pages to summarize your skeleton argument on. So you've got well-known DJ radio, Max intended to cycle from here to here for raising charity on air. Um, Thomas called him out, challenged him for a four day challenge. And if not so, thousand pounds, hundred thousand pounds to him. Having accepted this challenge, making sure that you're using the legal terms that yes, Max accepted this challenge on air, Max with his colleague Ginny undertook this journey while broadcasting every day to the show. So make sure that you use these terms, make sure you look at the moot problem very carefully. And I would emphasize that read it at least five to six times because you will miss out on very important terms. Broadcasting every day indicates that Thomas must have known that he started the journey. On the way, Tristan called on the show and withdrew his offer, claiming the deal was only to be performed. Max now sues Tristan, the High Court, for this, this, this. That is a very short summary of the facts of the case. So please be very precise when it comes to that. Grounds of appeal. Max now appeals on the following grounds. These are given in the moot problem already. First ground of appeal. Um, you will not be doing this case in your mooting problems, so... Um, that's why I'm showing you the cases uh, that were used in this case. Um, we've got three different submissions. The first senior appellant will be presenting. So the senior appellant would have to introduce everyone in the moot and then they would have to ask the judges for a brief summary of the facts of the case. And then they would begin with their submissions. First submission would be Carlo Carbolic, second would be Blue and Ashley, third would be Dahlia and Errington. You do not have to divide the cases according to the paragraph numbers. It's completely up to your choice if you wish to combine both two cases in one submission. It is absolutely your choice. Second round of appeal, we had four submissions. So that means each submission would have been shorter, I'd say two to three minutes rather than three to four minutes in the first round of appeal. This is by the junior counsel of the appellant side. You will not be introducing anything and um, you will begin from saying, um, may it please the court, um, I will now proceed with my first submission, which is the case of Arnold and then Durham, Central London, and the last case right over here. So as you can see, they have to be very precise. You, considering you will send this over to your um, opposing counsels, make sure you don't include too much because then the opposing counsel will know exactly what you will be speaking and they will potentially rebut you down. So be careful and do not include too much information in the skeleton argument. Finally, in conclusion, 
the appellant requ requests the courts to allow the claims on the above grounds and your name and your partner's name and obviously the university and a date over here, which would potentially be a date of the day of removing competition. So I hope this clarifies everything. Um, are there any questions about the material facts, the skeleton argument, the contract law, which I don't remember, it's been two years, but um, anything, please feel free to unmute yourselves or drop a text in the chat box. Um, when you send the PowerPoint with like information, is it okay to send that um, skeleton argument just so it's good to look at for like when drafting a new one? Okay, yes, I will. I will look okay. at that. Thank no you. No worries. Hi, would the um, questions from the judges, would they be from your skeleton argument or would it be from what you say on the day of speaking? Um, right, okay, that's actually quite a good question. Uh, judges, um, potentially judges would have looked at your skeleton argument two days before, so they would not have many questions from the skeleton. However, the way you submit it, so let's say I am describing my first round of appeal and I'm mentioning the case of, um, I'm just gonna have a look right now so I can give you an example. Sorry, just a sec. Um, if you mention the case of Carl and Carbolic Smokeball and you're saying that this was a contract rather than an invitation to treat, um, the judges will ask you, for example, can you please explain why it was a contract? And they will present scenarios where they will say that it could have been a mere path, it could have been an invitation to tree, and they will necessarily not ask you questions on your skeleton argument, but rather on what you're saying on that day. So you have to be careful that you don't somehow contradict yourself or um, say something which the judges would potentially say, oh, I need to ask that person where she got this case from. For example, if I say that um, a mere path is an invitation to treat and I specify something, they will ask you, what is your authority for that? And if you do not have that authority in your bundles, they will emphasize that, why are you using that in the court if it's not in your bundles? So be very careful. Judges can ask you lots of questions and they will ask you a lot of questions. And sometimes what they will do is, um, if, for example, the first round of appeal, you've got a set order in the skeleton argument which says Carlo Carbolic and then the case of Blue and then the case of Dahlia. They will say, um, can you please begin your submissions from the case of Dahlia? So that means you'll begin your submissions from the last submission which you had originally planned. So you will have to go the reverse order. So they will potentially throw you off by asking you such questions, asking you to do such things. Um, Jessica, I will be discussing bundles in five minutes. I'm so sorry I've not done that yet. I will do that right now. Um, I hope that clears your confusions, Ryan. Yeah, it, thank you. No worries. Any other questions, please? No worries. Um, right, okay. I'm going to quickly share screen again. I understand it's been a long session, however, we had to cover a lot, so I apologise for the two hours I have taken. Um, you, can you see the screen? Yes? Yes. Perfect. Um, quickly going to go through the judges' feedback sheet. So, as you can see, judges have 10 marks for your oral, 10 marks for your structure. So, oral presentation skills, speaks clearly, fluently, confidently engages and interacts. That means eye contact. That means speaking to the judges. That means saying correct formalities. My lord, my lady, please do not call your male judge my lady, because I did that once. Um, appropriate language, tone and pace, manner, um, avoid distractions, link to your skeleton argument. Um, linking is, for example, saying, my lady, my lord, if I refer you to the case of Carlo Carbolic Smoke Bowl, could you please refer to paragraph four of the appellant skeleton argument, just so that whatever you're saying, they have it right in front of them. I hope that makes sense and I was not going too fast. Avoid distracting mannerisms, please. 10 marks, as you can see. Moving on, you've got 10 marks for the structure and content. Um, identifies and adopts a logical and coherent structure. That means you plan your submissions. You say that my lady, my lord, I'll be discussing number one this, number two this, number three this, and then you start with your submissions and then you bring them to a really good conclusion as well. 
advances persuasive argument. Um, basically, this means that you are able to persuade the judges that your client should be allowed the appeal or should not be allowed the appeal if you're the respondent in the scenario. So um, that is your way of working way you're working your way around the script if you're using a script or the way you speak to the judges and bring in logical ideas to back up your um whatever perspective that is response appropriately to judicial intervention replying to the judges if you do not know the answer you can always say my lord my lady i apologize i do not know the answer to your query may i please proceed with my submissions um also in my mooting competition what happened is that i had to take 30 seconds away because i was thrown away by my judge's question what i did is i told my lady my lady may i please have a while to refer to my notes and she actually gave me extra marks for that because that requires confidence to do so telling the judge that I need some time so please feel free to do that do not feel that you have to ramble something when the judge asks you a question I hope that clarifies everything um that is potentially the last slide however I had to quickly discuss the bundles which I will be doing now until then if there are any questions please send them over or feel free to unmute yourself and speak So let right. me ask uh, whether the participants will get feedback from non-knockout round. Yes, Amy. Um, the judges will give you a proper feedback. They will give you the sheet. They will give you their comments. And hopefully you can use all of those comments and the feedback in your knockout rounds after the Christmas break. Um, you, um, is there anything I forgot to mention? No, not uh, other than the bundle. Yeah. And I think I have something to add on yes, in regards to the uh, questions that was asked, I think by not mistaken by Amy. So if you guys really want to watch moods, like uh, example of really, really good moods and the ways in which you can submit, uh, there are a few videos that I actually uploaded in your learning central. So if you take a look at the folder of the uh, mood, which not mistaken, yeah, there are a few videos then there and you can refer to it. Uh, they, are being, uh, they, they will show you how you should submit if you are a senior counsel, junior counsel, either from the appellant side or the respondent side. Thank you so much you yes i will emphasize once again learning central have a lot of videos on mooting so please refer to them i will quickly show you bundle authorities before that i think i mentioned that i had to show you all something after the session does anyone remember what that was because i do not potentially remember that other than bundle authorities is there anything uh, i'm missing out anything i was supposed to be showing you guys does the example of a skeleton argument um i think yeah, um, I think we just showed the skeleton argument. Um, we have showed the, yeah, I think that would be it then. If anyone remembers, please do let me know. I will show you the bundle authorities now. So I'm sharing screen. Um, uh, finder, there we go. Um, you, can you see my screen? The tabs yeah yes yes yeah, perfect if you all could please have a look so um this is a this is a virtual moot so um if you now look tab one tab two tab three tab four tab five tab six it is very annoying but you have to do this tab seven till 13 right if i'm going to open tab number one these all have, all to, have to these all have to be sent um 48 hours before with the skeleton argument to your opposing counsels and to the judges. I'm going to show you an example of tab number one. Um, you, can you see the tab I opened? Yes. What can you see right now? Sorry, because I don't. Uh, tab one. Okay, and it's showing, showing the case of Mohammed Al Fayed, yeah? Uh, no, it, it does not, it hasn't opened yet. Let me, let me show that again. Yes, can you see me now? 
Yes, I can see it now. If you look, have a look, tab number one has the first page in the Westlaw case judgment. You have to have the case name, the court, the date, and the representation of the judgment. Now, if you move on, um, in the same tab, I have two pages. It's a PDF file, page one and page two. Every case you use, every tab, page one has to be the front cover of the case. Please make sure. Do not put a judgment where the case name is not shown. The judges will call you out on that. Now, if you look at the second page, I referred to this paragraph 14, rule 3120, exactly this in that moot. So I highlighted it and I sent it over to the judges. Does that clarify on how to use and make a bundle authority? I will show it thus. I will in fact show another tab just to clarify. Tab number six. Hmm. Okay. I hope you can all see this. This is tab number two. Case name, court, date, first page from Westlaw. I use this in my submissions, therefore I've highlighted it. And then this is how I've highlighted it. Obviously I didn't say the entire thing, but I referred to a few bits and pieces. Um, also, if I'm making a point, I can't remember which round this was. If I'm making a point, I will be saying, my Lord, my lady, can you please refer to tab number two, page number two, highlighted section. If you want line one, two, three, four, whichever you're referring to, it really would add marks to your mood and then tell them that this is the reason why I'm making this specific point. Once again, tab two, two pages. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Does that clarify on how to use a bundle authority? Uh, unfortunately, so... I've, yeah, I've just saw the question. It does not. Um, I will add an additional side where I will also include how to include your bundle authorities. I will hopefully send that slide over, that PowerPoint presentation over to Jessica by tomorrow, and you will have them before the weekend. Any questions, please? I think that is the um, end to the session, unless I'm forgetting something, which I can hopefully email everyone. Um, if you've got any questions, feel, please feel free to stay back and ask me if you want to personally. If you've got any issues, please do email Jessica, Eleanor, or the Law Society. I hope this was useful. I know it's been really long, but, um, your dedication is seen in these two hours. Um, any questions, please ask or else feel free to leave. Thank you so much for attending everyone.